Nightmares. Yes, who indeed the fook is that guy? A lot of people are asking the same question. The name is Nathaniel Phillips. In his first six games, Liverpool got four clean sheets. And if that doesn't say enough about his performances, he was also player of the month for Liverpool Football Club. Now, what kind of player is he? The Bolton Beresi started out at Bolton's Academy, where Liverpool signed him on a free transfer from their under-23s. Liverpool's scout team are phenomenal, spotting someone that not even Bolton liked as a first teamer. I think maybe Klopp wanted to help the academy by adding some physical dominance in the air to let the Gagan pressing game flourish. Looking at Natastuda's role in the team, he is strongest at central defender. I'm putting an asterisk at left centre back because he favours using his right leg. If the squad was in desperate need for a holding midfielder, he could perhaps be used as a destroyer type, making the most of his defensive attributes to win the ball and make short passes to get out of trouble, rather than being a playmaker. It was by chance that that man got his call up to the first team as a regular, as Liverpool were ravaged with injuries. You can see how it affected the back four, but it also really affected the midfield, who had to join out and help out in the back four, with Fabinho and Henderson both playing there for long stretches of the season. We have little to go off so far, but I think it's safe to say he's passing the Rodgers test. Going off only a few interviews, he seems like a boring James Milner type, but if you're playing something like football manager and you've got a team of boring James Milner types, that's exactly what you want. It takes us closer. It's another three points. It's no secret that it's necessary for us to win all our remaining games. And that's another one tick. So no strippers, no blackjack. Just a player showing great character. The bright spark we're throwing at the top police this week is how one outstanding attribute on one player can have a gigantic tactical impact on a team and its fortunes. You can use this information to be more resourceful on Football Manager or in real life when you're coaching. Any fan that watches will tell you he is very good in the air and just how hard a worker he is. But let's take a closer look at what makes him great at heading and how it affects the team. And how it's kind of in a lot more ways than you'd think. Aerial defending is certainly Natman's superpower, but he is still just a little bit below Van Dyke's level due to his height and strength. So if we take a look at the Aerial's one average from whoscored.com, Natman is in the clear lead out of the centre backs that were playing this season. His height compares well to Van Dijk, but certainly shows that it's not the prime reason for his aerial prowess. A look at how he compares to the rest of the team makes it clear that it helps. The fact it helps is perhaps why Klopp is looking to sign a tall centre-back in summer called Konate, at 195cm tall. Comparing their height, Natman isn't the tallest by any means, but he makes up for it with jumping and anticipation. You can see that the new signing Konate in the middle in the yellow is a good deal taller than Kabak, and I think because of this strong advantage in the air, Liverpool perhaps shouldn't sign Kabak in the summer to save money for other areas of the team. Quite frog-like in his jumping skills, an expert at timing and also getting up high. He makes the most of this asset to offset any lack of other attributes while doing it in a way where he doesn't foul. He is strong with a tall frame and if he gets to the ball first he can hold it off with ease. In 50-50s he'll win most duels as you can see from this stat. He makes the best use of his strength while he's challenging in the air. He's no Van Dyke in terms of strength but he makes up for it with technique. Obviously the strength of aerial defending helps Liverpool cope with any defending long balls that they need to cope with. It even sees teams stop attempting it altogether, knowing that they're going to concede possession too easily. It is so goddamn refreshing in a world full of walk for your wages, Ozils and Balotelli's and Deli Alley's just not giving a fuck to watch Natman smash people, trash them in the air and stretch for every ball with every fibre of his being for a full 90 minutes every week. Fantastically dramatic tackling to save the day again and again. There there was an old saying about central defender Paolo Maldini that his shorts were never dirty because he stayed on the feet and read the game so well in anticipation. Our superhero can learn from Maldini and become a Bolton 
Baresi by anticipating and using his body shape a little bit better. On whoscored.com it shows that Natman is the 7th best on the team averaging a 1.2 tackles per game. This isn't outstanding but still goes a long way in helping his team. Nathaniel is quite good at playing it safe, but can get lured into trying to break the lines too much. Opposition teams set up traps to counter-attack, but he has not been cut out in a way that has led to many goals. Liverpool have been fantastic at getting him to play a Trent wide or wait for a defensive midfielder to come short. You can see here the pass completion rate of Reese Williams is quite impressive, but with both centre-backs coming into the team, you'd expect Natman to be a little bit better. All of this praise I've been putting on Nat Phillips cannot be complete without fully appreciating the Robin to our Nat man, Kabak, who has performed extremely well while on loan. He may have earned himself a permanent signing in the summer, but I see it more likely that Konate will be all of the centre-backs that will be signed, unless somebody goes out. Which, it would be understandable if the injury-prone but brilliant Matip goes out. So we've discussed Natman's main attributes and his superpower aerial defending. Now it's time to discuss how that has a gigantic tactical knock-on effect on the rest of the team's tactics. It sure is easier to play a high line when you win the first ball in the air. Losing the first ball would mean that you have to drop the midfielders closer to pick up the second knockdowns. The higher line is a clear component of Jurgen Klopp's game and has an effect on all areas of the team. With the team operating higher up the field, the opportunity for counter-attacks happen far more often. The counter-attacks can be done with more conviction now that Fabinho is winning the ball higher up the field. Because teams can't carve LFC open in the air anymore, they have to play through, and this has Liverpool in their comfort zone. One of the world's best pressing sides, they are hassling teams high up again, and this confidence is spreading to other areas of their game. The higher pressing style marks the return of beautiful counter-attacks that Klopp is arguably the best in the world at. He is really good at creating openings for the other team, luring them into traps that he can start dangerous counter-attacks from. They love tempting the opposition number six into receiving the ball and then getting surrounded quickly by midfielders. The tempo is sped up a little bit under Natman, but Liverpool were playing quite fast anyway. The only difference was they were playing between the lines, progressing the ball through the phases, instead of playing a long ball in behind the defence, which Van Dijk used to do. Another thing stopping them from playing the long ball in behind was Henderson and Fabinho were playing in central defence. They would have usually played the ball from midfield instead. Curtis Jones and Thiago, they like to dwell on the ball a little bit longer and play passes out wide to Trent or Salah. So you can see how Natman affects this. Liverpool thrive when playing transitional gegenpressing pressing counter-attacks, and I would genuinely hate to see the signing of Thiago start an Arsenal-like trend of trading Vieiras and Petits for Flaminis and Fabregas type players. Keep the heavy metal football style, keep your Fabinho with his long legs and violent tackles, keep your Milners grafting everywhere and your Hendersons running like Forrest Gump. Heavy metal football is what won the league and the Champions League. Don't change it. Liverpool seem to get more penetration when they're playing counter-attack transitional football rather than a tiki-taka or possession-keeping safe football. They were playing through the lines very fast, but maybe they weren't hitting that direct ball over the top, or maybe they weren't losing the ball enough to start a counter-attack of their own. They would lose the ball, win it back, and then counter-attack. That seems to be when they're most dangerous. It's not about just giving it away though, it's about losing it in the right areas of the field, at the right time. They play this style more with Natman in the team. So in the pre-Natman days, Liverpool were substituting Thiago's technique for Fabinho's physicality in midfield. The lack of ball winning skills meant that Liverpool were playing less transition and playing more technical passing and dribbling. This led for a slower build up and a safer defend on the ball type strategy. And while they were breaking the lines, they were moving the ball slower up the field. You can see the possession stats held well, but they definitely needed more penetration and zip to the passes in behind. Liverpool's passing style was a lot shorter this season as they missed Van Dijk's long passing range. This led to a more ticky tackle led approach, which showed up in the possession stats. When the front three stretch the field more, it makes it easier for Liverpool to play line breaking passes with more space allowed between the lines. 
Liverpool were trying to break the lines too often instead of playing direct. Stretching the field is one of the most important and underestimated tactical elements of football. And when the midfield was playing central defender, the front three were dropping deeper to help compensate. They were trying to create numerical overloads centrally, but this meant that they were stretching the field less. Now with this sorted, it brings the field dynamics back to where it was and its prime functionality, with a lot more penetration in behind and a lot more space in between the lines. The wingbacks, who for a season or two were the best in the world, seemed to have acquired enough room to make plays again, with the opposition pinned centrally by penetrative rotational movement or simply being open on transition. This is the area where he is good, but can improve. He is not blessed with elite pace, so his anticipation, body shape and positioning must help compensate. They must figure out a new leader to control the line now that Van Dijk is out injured, and that man could be that guy. Certainly not as fast as Gomez or Van Dijk, this is an area where positioning and anticipation must help out. To offset the lack of pace, it might not be suitable to play man marking the whole time. Zone marking is hard to balance your aggression because if you push up you leave space behind you and with a lack of pace you won't get back in time. If you just mark the space you can contain the opponent and wait for the world class defence mid Fabinho to come and help out. Not a bad option. So I'm going to show you how Natman can mark the space a little bit better to stop attacks. He has a highly aggressive style and he doesn't shy out of any challenges that come his way. This is mostly good for aerial challenges, but we'll discuss why it's not so good on the ground. So in training mode, I'm going to show you how aggression balance is very important. A lot of players that are really good in the air are rewarded by aggression, but on the ground, when they're being aggressive, it can make them get sucked in and then counter-attacked in behind. So in the first demonstration, you're going to see Phillips press up aggressively and win the ball and set up a counter-attack. That's brilliant. That is the benefit of being aggressive on the ground. In the second clip, you're going to see Nat Phillips press up and lose out to the pass in behind. This is the bad side of effect from pressing up aggressively from your back line. Now in the final example on pitch 3, you can see the second attacker, the runner, isn't far enough to threaten the back line. In this scenario it would be perfect for Phillips to push up. Now I know what you're thinking, why don't the other defenders cover him? But in the high speed tempo where Trent is marking the winger and the other centre back and left back are marking the other striker and other winger, time and time again the ball is going in behind because Natman is pushing up, or any central defender for that matter. So just leave that job to the defensive midfielders. This really is a big issue with Liverpool. If you watch the games, you can even just look as far back as the West Brom game, where Reese Williams pushes up for their goal. And you may have thought that Robertson had it, but it is more difficult than you think. I encourage you to watch out for this problem in games. You're going to see it. This responsibility has to be granted by the manager and coaching staff on the training ground, but it would be certainly helpful in the area of organising the back four to stave off penetrating attacks. So in football there's a lot of art and flavour and taste. Sometimes it lacks the ruthless results finding that military tactics have. We're going to give Natman a leadership responsibility in the back four that has been sadly lacking since Van Dijk was injured. And we're going to give him the role of policing the offside line or the back line. We're going to discuss three main methods that teams use when they're doing this. First one I call trench warfare. The trench warfare method of policing the line was seen in the Champions League final when PSG played Bayern Munich. Bayern feared the pacey front three of Mbappé Neymar and Di Maria. So dropping off with sensitive triggers helped them win the Champions League. When there was any kind of threat that the ball would go in behind the back four, they would drop off about 10 yards immediately and eliminate any chance of this happening. Now there's obviously the catch of leaving way too much space in the cam roll in that space between the lines. And Neymar did flourish with that but all the chances were not dangerous enough to create goals. This is what Liverpool should do to make the most out of his pace and cover up any blemishes, while utilising a world-class defensive midfielder like Fabinho to help compensate in that space in the midfield. So in terms of development, anticipation is the most important one of all. Here I'm comparing two Natmans, the aerial Natman and the ground Natman. In defending transition, he needs to anticipate a little bit more cleverly. The traditional idea of the offside trap is too risky in my opinion. 
one player is wrong at the precise moment the opposition are through on goal. It is also harder to coach as the timing has to be impeccable. While this can be used, I would not use this as the primary way to defend in the back four. This is a method called holding the line. So when the opponent is about to pass, there's no offside trap snapping up, there's no trench warfare retreating, there's just a flat line standing perfectly still. So the hold the line approach is very very good for making it easy for your midfielders to have a reference point when they're pressing. They can just say, here's my defensive line, I can press up this much and there'll be this much space behind me. But there's a really big catch. If you just hold the line and the player makes the pass not offside behind you, then they're gone. You're going to find it very difficult to catch up with them and stop the 1v1 versus the goalkeeper. His body shape is fantastic when he's defending headers. I'd give it a 10 out of 10 because he keeps his arms out of harm's way every time and the referee has almost never called a foul on him for this reason. As for his body stance when defending on the ground, he could improve this to get a better starting time and accelerate faster when defending counter-attacks. Sports psychology can mainly be about finding simplicity amongst the chaos. To do this, you can use self-talk or a mantra. Using these techniques during a game can help a player excel at a pattern of play that he needs to accomplish. The mantra I apply to my centre-backs when I'm coaching a team is quite simple. Two words, goal side. Repeating goal side throughout will start as his reference point where he can then go through his other reads of threats to the defence. This starting point will increase focus, confidence and awareness. Once my centre defender has goal side taken care of, then all the lesser threats can follow. So you'd think a guy that's this good at defending in the air would be killing it on attacking corners. And while he's come close, he hasn't quite hit the net yet. So this is definitely an area where he needs to improve. But sometimes this can be an area where you score once and then you get confidence and keep doing it again and again. He can improve his creative passing in the simplest of ways, but it will need help from Mohamed Salah and the front three. The moment he gets it in transition, he should look for the top line of the attack and try and play a well-weighted pass in behind. This will also keep his passing safe in that if it is lost, it will be lost higher up the field. New centre backs can be criticised for chucking it long sometimes, but now that he's become a more confident member of the team, I think players and coaches alike will encourage him to play more creative passes like this. So how does Natman affect the transfer budget? He was kind of a player that was not expected to break into the first team. You could treat this as a 15 million coming from absolutely nowhere. It really is a big win. But with his heading attributes really showing a massively positive effect on the team, it's easy to see why Jurgen Klopp is looking at Konate this summer. Konate is similar height to Van Dijk, he's very strong in the air, he's got Champions League experience so he's pretty good with his feet and he's got a knockdown price because of contract clause. I anticipate that there's definitely going to be Van Dijk, I hope there's going to be Konate. Kabak might be signed but I don't think he should if we're getting Konate. I really want Phillips to stay, I want Reese Williams to stay and really controversially I want Gomez to be sold along with Matip because Matip gets injured too much. This would see a massive cut down in the wages and it would see all of the centre backs able to compete in the air. Gomez just lacks the aerial ability that the other four have. You could sell him for a pretty hefty fee while he's this young and his attributes are so strong in passing in other areas. If you would like to join the Dots on social media, please join us at Dots Tactics or just look up Dots Tactics channel on any social media platform. I will totally understand if you don't want to join us of course because who animates a lamppost in the middle of a training field? It was a mistake but I'm going to leave it there because I think it's kind of funny.